One thing I really missed in my own musical education was a discussion about general principles of musical form, independent of style. It's all very nice to know that classical composers wrote minuets and trios and that Wagner did not, but is that really all we can say about form? It changes with style? Human neurology has not changed much, even over long historical periods. Cultures change, but if music doesn't respect the evolved limits of the human mind, it's not likely to appeal to listeners. If we can still listen to Bach and music of other cultures and enjoy the experience, there must be certain common elements in the way humans perceive music. Music is made up of organized sounds, creating various sorts of patterns, which in turn create expectations that the composer can play with. Certain kinds of patterns, like a strong pulsing beat, are physically stimulating and we easily connect with them. Others, like motives, require a bit more mental perspicacity to understand, but they're still within the capabilities of any normal human. Listen to something completely random, however, and you will quickly feel disconnected or even irritated. The human mind is definitely affected by cultural conditioning, but there are limits that no culture goes beyond. In our last lesson, on motives, I gave the following example. Here there are just too many motives in a very short time for us to remember and make sense of. In the same way, a paragraph of prose that changes the subject every sentence just seems incoherent. Most composers would agree that unity is a common aesthetic goal. The problem lies in what we consider to be unity. For example, some 20th century systems composition are entirely based on mathematical formulas that are unfortunately completely inaudible. Just because someone can analyze a score mathematically does not in any way equate to audible coherence. Some theorists and composers following Schoenberg's ideas think that all the musical material in a given piece should be derived from one motivic cell. But this doesn't address the fact that music takes place in time. Just because measure 247 is derived from the same motive as measure 6 is no guarantee that a listener will notice it. The key point here is that music depends on our memory, like normal conversation. When talking with another person, we first look for connections from one sentence to the next. Take this paragraph. America is a democracy. China is communist. The dog's hair is all over the carpet. We quickly sense at least some connection between the first two sentences, comparing America to China, but the third sentence is very odd, since there seems to be no relation to the previous two sentences. This points to an essential factor in musical coherence. First and foremost, each moment must seem connected to the moments before and after it. We compare what we hear at the moment with the events in short-term memory, and we expect some kind of association. This doesn't mean we can't return later to significant moments, nor does it mean there can never be any contrasting ideas. In fact, if we think of the common children's game, where each person repeats a story to the person beside them, and we examine what comes out after 10 or 15 retellings, it's easy to see that even if successive elements are very closely associated, after a while we can end up very far indeed from where we started. But if the immediate succession of ideas shows no evident continuity, as in that paragraph above, we usually just include that the whole thing makes no sense. We've mentioned in previous lessons that music can include more than one plane of tone at a time, for example for orchestra. Normally there's a foreground which attracts our attention immediately, and there may also be a background less prominent as well. Counterpoint uses this mental capacity of ours all the time. This makes many things possible in musical form, since it determines how prominent an association will be. Here's an example. In this example, the second and third bars are very obviously related to the first bar, just arranged in a diatonic sequence. But listen to this. Now the third bar is much more contrasting. Is it totally incoherent? Well, there actually are some common points between the first two bars and the third one. They're all played on the piano. The tempo is constant, most of the notes in the scale are the same, only B flat is new in measure 3 and C sharp in measure 4. These things aren't the first thing we notice, they're not in the perceptual foreground. Playing with them can make quite a difference. So we could say that although the new idea in measure 3 does indeed provide stronger contrast than the previous example, it isn't totally disconnected. Now compare this version.
Here the motives are the same as in the previous example, but the new idea is transposed. This has the result that at the end of measure 2 and the start of measure 3, there are now two common tongues, C and E. Also, there are no new accidentals at all. So we could say that the new idea in measure 3 is more closely linked to the old one in measure 2 than it was in the previous version. Now an example in the other direction. Here I've changed the style of the harmony in measure 3, making it more dissonant. I've also changed the timbre. Therefore the contrast is much more pronounced. What about this example? Here I've made the connection between two ideas stronger. Not only have I chosen the version with the common tones, but I've also added counterpoint in the middle which recalls the first idea. The point of all these examples is that the degree of association between ideas can vary from extremely obvious to almost inexistent. It's not just black and white. This is the key to understanding musical contrast from a composer's point of view. Within a short time span, normally there will not be numerous large contrasts. But within a longer piece, there will be contrast providing more variety, which is just common sense. The longer the piece, the more variety we need to renew interest. Most problems in musical form result from getting the degree of contrast wrong in terms of where we are in the piece. But as we can see above, the composer can play with this, making contrast stronger or weaker by adding or subtracting common elements. And this is indeed a very important part of a composer's job, getting the degree of contrast just right. Playing with the various dimensions of a contrast, tempo, motives, register, timbre, and so on, as we did above, we can make the association between ideas more prominent or more subtle according to what we need at that moment in the form. This lesson is turned around musical unity, in particular over short spans of time. When we talk about recapitulation in another lesson, we'll have more to say about unifying longer spans of time.